Welcome to the Stonehenge View, a podcast series which interviews a range of local sports clubs during the COVID-19 shutdown period. We find out what these clubs are doing during the current health crisis, which has seen local sport postponed. I'm Mark Heenan, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Mark Stone. Welcome, Stoney. Yeah, thanks, Heenan. Always interesting and uh, waiting for the next guest to come on. But our guest today... I'll tell you, well, I'm going to get some insight into our next guest because uh, it's a sport that I don't know too much about, but I'm about to find out a lot more. Hey, Mark Stone, I reckon we've done five or six podcasts already, but this will be the funniest and probably the one that's the most lighthearted and the one that we can have a bit of banter with. What do you think? Oh, I think you're right there, Hino. Well, today we are joined by a fella who was awarded a bronze medal at the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow in Scotland in the sport of lawn bowls in the men's fours event. He was introduced to the sport of lawn bowls at the age of 12. He's the current Ocean Grove Bowls Club coach and has been in the role since 2012. He hails from the Ballarat region. He used to live in Backers Marsh before he moved to the Ballerine region and he's held a bowls coaching role also with the Essendon Bowling Club in Melbourne. Before he represented Australia in 2010, he weighed 155 kilograms. And by May 2012, he shed a remarkable 62 kilograms to trim down to 93 kilograms. He's played several hundreds of bowls representative matches for Victoria, was a state coach for the, for the state of Victoria at an under 18 level. He's led the Ocean Grove Bowls Club to multiple premier titles including the 2019 Geelong Ballarat Premier Bowls division title win over Queenscliff. He called time on his representative Australian Lawn Bowls career in 2015. Outside of Lawn Bowls he's a qualified cabinet maker. He's a keen Collingwood AFL fan which Stoney and I definitely hold against him. He likes a beer. He's a champion Team man, enjoys a spot of golf and he's an all-round good guy and a knockabout Aussie larrikin. He's a former International Bowler of the Year and he's the current co-host of the Bowl Show on 7-2 Fox Sports and KO and also has a column in the Geelong Advertiser and is written for the Ocean Grove Voice. We welcome to the Stonehenge View, Matt Flapper. Welcome, Matt. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure. How are you both? Going well. We're very good, Matt. And I guess in some ways, if we look at uh, your situation on the bowls front, I want to go back to uh, March this year. So let's just look at, uh, well, we're going to cover many angles today, but the first thing that I wanted to ask you about was, let's just look at the situation. So you're in a qualifying final against Eastern Park. You won it. You finished on top of the ladder. You go through to the grand final. The situation becomes the next week that the season's called off because of the COVID-19. Um, you finished on top of the ladder. Uh, in other local sports, like, as I said, cricket, when I've had discussions with you, the team that finished on top was award awarded the premiership. You weren't awarded the premiership. You didn't know at the stage that the COVID-19 was going to be as big as what it was. What was your sort of feeling sort of post-season and looking back now? Um, probably a little bit frustrated, mate, to be honest, because... We, we did. We started that final series. Um, we're playing against Eastern Park, the two best sides all year, um, in a final at Torquay. And it just for us, the message was, you know, we had to give it everything we could to, to make sure we were the first team to advance to a grand final because of the uncertainty um, surrounding COVID. And, you know, things were starting to close down. Restrictions were starting to be applied. But we were still playing. We didn't know how long that was going to go for. So we wanted to be in that pole position that um, if the season was called um, called off, that we uh, we were in the position that we could be crowned premier. So um, it was important for us to get to that stage. And uh, we did. We, we got out there and we won that game. We booked ourselves in the grand final. And then, yeah, that's it. End of season. And unfortunately, the GBR decided that um, they, it, they would deem the season basically null and void and not a water premier which was a bit frustrating. Um, and, but, you know, at the end of the day, we were there, we got to the stage, and I'm a firm believer that you should reward success. And it's not just at Premier League level. We, we have Premier Division through to Division 11. So um, I think it was important that those guys got recognised for their achievements this year. 
Just one thing, when you talk about the GBR, that's obviously the acronym for the Geelong Bowls region. Correct. That's right. Matt, Matty, what, just uh, in an off-season like we've never seen before, does anything really prepare you for uh, a pandemic or, um, you know, what are some of the things that a bowls coordinator does in times like these when, you know, we don't know when the season's going to start and the season gets finished early? What does a bowls coordinator do in those sort of situations? Well, in my role, I've probably got a, a few added duties rather than just bowls coordinator. But, um, you know, in relation to three years ago, we initiated or, or started uh, Ballerine Indoor Bowls, um, which has been really successful. And I think we've got about 135 members on the Ballerine playing indoor bowls through the winter months, which gets the, uh, you know, it gets the bowlers back out, um, socialising, interacting and competing in a different format of the game. So that's something that's occupied my winter for the last three years. So that's obviously come to a close and we haven't been able to do that. Um, in reference to programming for the current year, the hard part is that we can't. We can't program anything at the moment because of the uncertainty. When are we going to get back out on the greens? In what capacity? Um, and then you, you look at all these major bowls events worldwide and it starts at World Bowls and it flows down to Bowls Australia. That then comes to the Geelong, uh, to Bowls Victoria, sorry, then to the Geelong Bowls region and then to club level. So we're like fifth or sixth in the pecking order of structuring our calendar around everything else that goes on. So we might get to September, October, hoping to start a pennant season, but it might be on a whim. You know, we might be scheduling something weekly um, instead of having your fixture set out for six months. It might be suck it and see sort of thing. Matt, I wanted to talk about not just what's happening on the bowls green from a club grove, ocean grove bowling club perspective, but I wanted to talk about the business itself. Obviously, when we had the COVID-19 shutdown, it's had an impact not only on sporting clubs, but it's also had an impact on bars, clubs, you know, gaming facilities and that sort of thing. And, you know, even last year, you know, you'd go and put a bet on the Melbourne Cup or whatever, and the only place in Ocean Grove that you could actually go and do that is is obviously Club Grove, uh, unless you had an online betting account. Um, the, the hospitality aspect of the business, you know, the, the, the business has been shut down. I mean, just talk about you, you go, you've got an office there, you've got your own room, you've got your own little separate area, um, just overlooking the bowls green. Um, talk about sort of the conversations and the hospitality side, the club side of the business of Club Grove and what happened when uh, when you were forced sort of outside the business and what are the sort of continuing discussions of the business? Yeah, well, obviously it was early March, like I said, when we started that final series. So we, we sort of had this inclination that it was going to get worse and restrictions were going to become uh, much more severe. So it was sort of a two to three week period before finally on the 22nd of March, the club had decided that they could no longer trade. They, 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 the week before that 22nd of March, they did reduce the numbers allowed in the restaurant, in the TAB, in the gaming room and so forth. Um, and then all of a sudden it got to the 22nd of March and um, unfortunately it was no longer feasible to, to keep the doors open. So the business um, would shut down and basically we're in a position where I think it was 35 casual staff were told they no longer had their job. We had 20 full-time employees that were told to go to Centrelink. And then fortunate enough for those employees in the next couple of weeks, the government released the, um, the JobKeeper um, allowance, which obviously provided a bit of relief for those people. So as much as they're still on the books, hopefully sometime soon the club can reopen. But as far as we were just about to undertake a major renovation within the club, so that's been put on hold. And who knows, obviously with you know months of no trade, whether that's going to be able to be completed or not in the short term, it might end up being a long-term um, renovation now, who knows, but, uh, you know, and, and to this day, the club's still closed with uncertainty about when that, when that could open again. So it's taken a major hit. I mean, it's nearly three months now that um, the, the doors have been closed and that's loss of trade in bistro, in the restaurant, in gaming, in TAB, and your general members servicing that club. Matty, I'll take you back to what Hino said earlier about you got introduced to bowls at 12 years old. We see you now uh, at Ocean Grove through back to Smash, through Essendon, and now in Ocean Grove. Was bowls always 
a thing for you that you were going to eventually work in bowls or um, be employed in bowls or, you know, was there anything apart from bowls, apart from your carpentry, obviously, but was there anything, is this, is this your passion and your journey where you end up right today? So, I was pretty lucky, I think, um, in relation to where I am now and just the, the quick sort of breakdown of the journey. Um, started bowls, dad, your dad got me into bowls at Creswick um, when I was 12. And my brother and I both both took it up, but we we had uh, we had a, a bit of time playing soccer, um, racquetball, tennis, golf, a uh, bit of cricket here and there. But um, sort of just got to that stage where Saturdays were full of sport, but it got to the the point where I had to pick one. And bowls sort of just I don't know why, but that was the attraction for um, both Anthony, my brother, and, and I. And we went back to bowls, and and pretty much the rest is history. When I turned 17 or 18, I decided to go down to Melbourne and have a crack and played for Flemington Kensington um, for a few years before I had a go at Darabin City. And then um, from Darabin, went back to Ballarat. And all this time I was, I was a cabinet maker by trade. And uh, went back to Ballarat and got into greenkeeping. So I was a greenkeeper at Central Wendery Bowling Club for, I think it was about five or six years before I did have another go back in town and went to Essendon and where I took up a coaching position there. So done the rounds, basically greenkeeper, cabinet maker, and then Ocean Grove contacted me and threw up an opportunity as a bowls coordinator. And in Victoria, there's not many positions, there's not many bowling club, pokey funded sort of situations that clubs are in the position to put on a bowls coordinator. So very, very lucky to be offered that position originally. And for me then, I was represented, well, I wasn't representing Australia, but had aspirations to, and pretty much was on the verge of a possible green and gold call-up, which did eventuate. Um, so for me, having the bowling club endorse me in my role enabled me to obviously uh, go away, compete, and spend the time on the green that I needed to to uh, fulfil my goals of playing for the country. Maddie Flapper, one of the things that I find really inspiring about your story was particularly before you entered the Ocean Grove Bowling Club as the club um, bowls coach, was the, the situation with um, how much weight you lost. But what I want to know about is, I don't want to necessarily need to know about the physicals. You know, you would have changed your diet. You would have got fitness and, and that sort of thing. But one of the, the beauties of our program is that we've had people on from different perspectives. And one of the people that we've had on from Ocean Grove looks at the mental well-being space and he's a fitness coach now in his position he helps the football club in that role but I want to take you back to that time when you had to lose the weight and then you've had a distinguished career with Australia and representative career in with Victoria and you know bowls titles through the Club Grove Bowling Club but I want to take you back to the time how important was the mental side of losing that weight so not just the physical side but what were the mental things that you did um, and in the well-being space? And how, how did it, that improve your mental side when you lost all those kilograms? I think the major, the major aspect for me was, and it wasn't really based around um, whether I could get a call up for Australia or not at that stage. It was, I weighed 155 kilos and I wanted to prolong my life more than, uh, more than anything. And, you know, you weigh that much and it's, you're at risk of so many different diseases or uh, illnesses. And so it was basically uh, a, a, a well-being sort of situation that, all right, we're going to start a journey and, and see where that goes and and whatever comes of it, comes of it. But um, uh, we, we saw a weight loss consultant um, down in Werribee. And the moment we walked in the door, we listened to that person speak to us. I'm talking my wife and myself. And Linda. Listened. listened uh, to Carmel, her name was. Carmel talked to us and we left there with just a, a different perspective on a uh, different mindset, as you said, as to, uh, all right, getting it, getting healthier. Um, the rest of it sort of comes with it. I was struggling at that stage. I, I was popping pills to get through bowls games because of ankle soreness and knee soreness and, and so forth, back and neck and, you know, all that sort of ailments that carrying that amount of weight would, uh, would have on someone. So, for me, it was obviously get fitter if I was going to continue playing bowls and playing bowls at an elite level. 
And sometimes I'd be playing two, three weeks, four weeks on end without a day in between. So it uh, it was quite taxing. And, you know, they say bowls isn't in that over strenuous, but when you do it day in, day out for a number of days in a row, you certainly know about it and it takes a toll on your body. So it was just a case of try and get fitter and just mentally, I suppose, knowing what was what was, um, you know, good for you and bad for you. And I, I guess my biggest thing is how easy it is to go and play bowls, finish a game of bowls and have half a dozen stubbies. And, uh, yeah, I do love a beer. You mentioned that in the uh, in the opening. But at the end of the day, something had to give. And it was just every time I was at the bowls club, you'd probably go and have half a dozen beers or half a dozen cans of, of Jim and Jim Beam or Jack Daniels or something. like. So it was just... Reduce the mark, the uh, times that you did. Be smarter in your decisions, and um, you know, you said eat healthy, um, drink healthy, and all that sort of thing. And then, once I guess you start losing weight, I guess you just you just develop a new drive that you want to see a lower number every time you step on that scale, and that just pushes you to to keep going. And yeah, I had a I had never had a, a goal weight so to speak, from weighing in 155. But once I got down to 93, it was, oh, my God, you know. And that was that was sort of our new goal then was we had a wedding date. So wanted to look the best I could for our wedding date. And, look, I've fluctuated with weight on, off um, for the last few years. But, like, I know how to lose it. But it's certainly, uh, for me, it's easy to put back on too. Matty, I suppose that I want to take you back to the bowling aspect of, of uh, the bowls about the, the club and obviously the, the competition of bowls. We see an I'm an Aussie rules person and, and followed the game and played the game, but identify, identification of talent in a bowls person who has been a good at a person, good athlete at other sports, is it is it is bowls something that you find the naturals when you when you see them you just know or is it? Can you turn someone who's an average per bowler into a very good bowler? What's how much time does that take? Well, what turns an average bowler into a good bowler is hard work. Um, it's simple, and it's like any other sport, isn't it? But you do see people walk through the gate, and once you have that, initiate that conversation about their background and if they've been sports orientated, you certainly probably get your neck hairs up a little bit, and you go, "All right, we might be on a bit of a fast track here." But you can tell, you know, hand-eye coordination sort of thing. And, and they just take to it like a duck to water, so, um, so to speak. But, you know, and you, you do. There's, there's some that walk in the doors with that. There's some without. But um, as much as a challenge, the ones that don't have that sort of that background and that nous to, to pick up the game really quick, you've got to work harder with those, those people and, and try and develop them as not as quick as you can, but... Um, just give them more time to, to you know, work on the fundamentals. And But at the end of the day, to go from an average Joe to you know, someone that's pretty competitive and uh, can handle themselves, it's it comes down to time on the green and hard work, just like any other sport, I would say. Hey, Matty, one of the things about bowls, it, it consumes your life, we know that. And even in the off-season, you'll be doing lots of planning for the next season. Tell me at the moment... How are you communicating with the bowl staff, not and and the players that you've had in in the in the grades? Because one of the things about the club that you represent is that it's very well participated from a young age level to you know people that are in their sixties and seventies. It's it, it transcends a lot of age groups in a lot of ways. But I guess the thing is, um, you haven't had that sort of uh, you know constant. Um, interaction from a from a flesh point of view where you're you, you're talking to people in, in in person. I mean, are you having Zoom meetings or you are you catching up um, from a social distance point of view? How are you interacting with the staff at Club Grove and also the bowls players at the moment? So more so um, with the members. I thought it was super important for us. And like you said, with the age demographic that we have and the the varying age groups, um, we have a lot of people that are obviously on their own, elderly and um, you know, live on their own, but they rely on the club so much um, for their outlet and it's their lifeline. And I thought, just thought it was super important before everything shut down significantly that uh, we would use tools like TMAP, um, Messenger, text message. We have a list of about 25 members that were all given three or four members each. 
um, who might be living on their own um, need that constant connection with people, engagement. Um, so they've got a responsibility, those 25 people that they have to contact three or four members weekly just to check in, say good day, and have a chat. Um, so, you know, there's, there's 25, there's um, you know, about 100 members that are getting a regular phone call weekly. We have team app, which a chat sort of page is set up that anyone can get on at any particular time. We have guys that load jokes every day. We have guys that do a, an hour trivia session every day, photos. It's just so many different communication tools that um, our members are using so that people can stay connected, stay engaged and know that someone's always just a, a phone call away. Because it's, it is, it's, it's much more than just putting a bowl down, a bowling club. It's, and it's times like this where you, you really understand that and, and go, well, how much does this club actually mean to these people? So, you know, we did a, for the first time, what we're doing now, we did a Zoom meeting, committee meeting. Um, for, for probably half of our committee, that was an eye-opener. Um, never clicked on and used their camera on their, on their phone or their laptop before. So we only had one out of the eight that couldn't connect for some reason. But uh, we had seven of them. We ran a committee meeting two weeks ago, which was really good. So that's, you know, just those little things that have presented that just keep people connected and engaged. Matty, now, you know, we might have a scoop here. A little birdie told me that uh, the Ocean Grove Football Club, we see football clubs who have theme songs, you know, and we, I know that there is a cricket, Australian cricket team has under the Southern Cross, but I'm under the impression that the Ocean Grove Bowling Club have actually got someone to record a theme song that could be used on the on the green on the mat on a week with whenever they win now matthew can you confirm that you have done this can, and can i just to pl- go on can i just jump in here very interesting because i work i've worked for the ocean grove voice so my job is to go and get photos one of the things is they get into a huddle before and after and also after their smoko so surely when they do their huddle, that's where that song could develop. Yeah. So, Matty, is that correct that you have got a song done? And are you able to play that theme song on the, our Stoneheen show today? It is, it is a scoop and it is correct. Stoney, <laughs> it, uh, we have had it recorded. We've obviously we've sung the same song for about seven or eight years now. It's, it does go to the Richmond theme song. But um, we, uh, I do. I'm a Collingwood supporter, but I do think Richmond have the best uh, best song. But anyway, so we do. But it's never had the background music to it or anything like that. And I've got a mate that's um, just started a production company, Missing String Productions. So and he's going to go down a track where you know cricket clubs, bowls clubs, footy clubs, anyone that sort of has their song that um, would like it enhanced with background lyrics. Um, he can he can do it. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably giving him a plug too. Um, but any clubs out there that are listening that have a song or want a song, he can produce your song, put music to your current song. But uh, I've got it here, mate. I will go, play go it for on, you. Go for it. See if we can pick it up. Go mate. for it. We, we want to hear it. Bear with me. Okay, keep talking. I'll bring it up. Ah, well, here we go. Just put it on speaker, Matty. It's very good. Matty. There you are, boys. Thank you very much for that. Um, obviously... Yeah, that came across. That, yeah, 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 not too bad. We can uh, raise levels. That's all good. But we, we that's great. I'm, I'm an Essendon man, and, and I, I'm, I'm with you on the Richmond theme song. I think it's fantastic. Hey, um, Mark Stone, just, just one thing. Uh, your housemate is... He, he's an Ocean Grove bowler. He Did he ever tell he you... He thinks he is. <laughs> Did he ever tell you that Matt... Flapper could be a karaoke singer as well. No, he didn't. He did. Is that one of Matty's skills, Tino? 
I don't, I, I don't know, Mark Stone. But, hey, uh, look, I, I just want to mention of a few things here. So I told you before that he talks too much. He does. <laughs> he comes up to me on the bowling green and says, oh, can you get a photo with me? And I'll try and impress <laughs> Mr. Flapper. Oh, come on, Andy. Get over yourself. Uh, but the thing, the thing about it is, Matty, um, you know, you, 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 you told me, you said, um, Stoney and I, we, we sort of live not far away. And he says, oh, I live within a pitching wedge of Mark Stone's place. And, and you're, also, you're also doing a bit of a walking group and you've been helping the elderly and all that sort of thing. You, you're a qualified yeah, well, that's, cabin maker. Make it. Just tell actually, me about some of the things that you're doing. Yeah, in my spare time, I've actually uh, taken up a personal training course, and I've, especially for the elderly. So uh, I've got two, two clients at the I'm moment. I'm one of those. Yeah, uh, Mark Stone and Andy Wright. But it's more, um, you know, yeah, I get out there and I lead and these two follow. <laughs> <laughs> and and just um, talk to me about the bowl show, which is on 7-2 and KO and Fox Sports. Um, I believe uh, you, you re- pre-record it during the week and then uh, later in the week it goes to air. Just talk to me about that's uh, taken up a bit of your life at the moment uh, because there's no bowls on. Yeah, it was really good to get the call up for the uh, for the bowl show, and you know, Bowls Australia. Obviously, they have their their couple of people that normally host the show, but obviously with interstate travel and so forth, they they couldn't get into into Victoria, so they had to dust off a uh, an old boy, old Victorian boy, to come on board and help out. But it's been really good, and obviously to be able to bring um, bowls of some description to the living room of of the uh, the bowls public has been great. So obviously we've done eight shows now and Sundays at two o'clock on Fox two, uh, sorry, on seven two and then uh, replayed on Fox on uh, Tuesdays at five o'clock, I think it is. So yeah, it's been good. And obviously we got the chance to engage with a few of the current Australian Jackaroos and talk to them each week and then uh, show a bit of the bowls Premier League action as well. So it's been great. M- Mark Stone, what a great Guest to have uh, Matty Flapper on. Um, Matt Flapper, thanks for joining us on the podcast today on the Stonehen View. It's great to get a, a view on a local sports club coach that knows obviously a bit about the gaming side and the business side and the impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, we really appreciate uh, what you're doing. You know, you've got a lot of active things going on in your life outside of bowls. And that's great that you're helping the elderly and the, the fitness side. Um, Thanks for joining us on the program and thanks for, and we're, and we're happy to support the Bowls show on, on those uh, media platforms, as you said. Excellent, boys. Thanks for the, uh, for the invite and good to have a chat. Thanks, Matty. Um, I appreciate that. No worries, yeah, that's guys. great stuff. Um, so just to let you know, you can get in contact. Uh, if you've got a guest in mind on the Stonehen View, you can check us out on our Facebook page. You can type in the Stonehen View. Our, pod, our podcast is also available on Apple iTunes. We're on Podbean. We're also on Spotify. So uh, it's great to be talking about that. And, and Mark Stone, any departing words? No, just uh, really good insight into a, a local person that's bringing his professionalism to his club. Uh, and obviously with Matty's experience, uh, it's really good to see the young bowlers getting involved with the game and with the club down at the Grover. So that's a, a really great, uh, great chat. Until next time on the Stonehen View podcast, we're going to be talking to a local netball coach who's about to give birth in the coming weeks. Um, who's about to who's about to go on maternity leave so um, she's a wonderful individual and someone that I know personally and look look forward to our uh, next chat with that person so bye for now and we'll see you next time on the Stonehenge View.